Um, scripture readings, uh, first reading is from the prophet Micah, verses, uh, six, or chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. And I'm reading from the King James Version. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He hath shown thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. And the second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, um, verses 31 through 46. And again, King James. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. And I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. And I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. And I was sick, and ye visited me. And I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then, the, then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of one of my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. And I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And here ends the reading. Would you be with me in a <clears throat> moment of prayer? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So what ought we to do? It's a fundamental question. It's the ethical question, the moral question. The we is all of us together. The ought is the moral imperative. The to do is what actions are required. What we ought we to do is a fundamental question. It is what the philosophers call a first question. There are other first questions other than the moral. There's the aesthetic. What is the nature of beauty? There is the ep epistemological. How do we know? What is the nature of reality? These viewpoints are from the classical philosophers, the Platonists, and the pre-Socratics, not known to the early Hebrew prophets. Micah is uh, in the sixth century BC and does not, and uh, the cultures don't interact 
uh, with uh, Greece until uh, Alexander the Conqueror uh, unifies and the uh, library is built in Alexandria. To be helpful, the answers to those intellectual, to those ethical questions must be objective and they must be generalizable. That's what moves us to justice. If they are not those things, then they are trivial. The moral imperative is what do we do? What actions do we take and how do we decide? This is not Buddhism and this is not monastic contemplation. As I say, the answers must be generalizable. They must be able to be argued for and understood and therefore refined, <coughs> refined and improved. They can't be the decision to have coffee or tea or uh, vanilla ice cream or chocolate ice cream. Those are trivial and those cannot be analyzed and argued for. Those attitudes cut off di dialogue and leave us helpless. Spoiler alert, that situation to me is the outer darkness. So can our Judeo-Christian texts inform these questions? Let me digress for a second as to how the texts came to be troubling me, <laughs> troubling me and challenging me year after year. Uh, there, as well as the religious traditions, there are, are of course other authorities that can attempt to answer these questions. There's science, there's experience, there's rational discourse. One morning, December 26th, the day after Christmas in 2004, uh, about four o'clock in the morning, we gathered here in the vestry, 28 of us, uh, led by Suli Gajewski and Kathy Wallace, 28 people, 14 adults and 14 young people, and we headed to Honduras for 10 days. And we did good work. Uh, we built a parsonage, we taught some English, we uh, worked with uh, children and adults, we distributed uh, clothing and some $3,000 worth of goods that we had uh, brought with us there. And we had camaraderie and fun and uh, bonding. Sue Lee announced that we would have a Vespers every night and asked the first one of just the group of the, the 28 of us, although there were several church services when we were down there. And Sue Lee asked me to lead one of them, which was, oh, what am I gonna do now? And the Matthew text, those words of ministering unto me and being sick and clothing and hungry and coming to me were, were, were sort of rattling around my head. I didn't know where they were and I asked her to help me find them and she did. And, and we read those as the text for that Vespers and uh, it's been with me ever since. We spent uh, about, as I remember, $1,500 a piece to get there and we had some scholarship money for, for some folks and we put tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and so what is the good of that? The same question and the same challenge has been rattling around since I was reading uh, 19th century philosophers uh, they gave that same challenge about Dr. Albert Schweitzer. Dr. Schweitzer was a, a world-class organist, played a concert tour, a box scholar for big bucks, earned a lot of money, gave it up and went to French equatorial Africa. The same kind of thing is exemplified by Paul Farmer in Haiti who was a PhD author and researcher in anthropology, I believe, and went to Haiti. So that challenge about what we did in Honduras and what was the best way to, to do those things 
has been bothering me and is a perpetual question without any clear answer. The other text, the Micah, is on that first window, the furthest to the left, hard to see from the pews uh, that you're sitting in. Go and look at it. <clears throat> the Lord has told you what is good. Do justly, create justice, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. And what I want to say about that, the reason, the reason that came to me is because I've been sitting in that choir loft for 30, 30 years on, on, that, on that end, looking at it and just looking at it. The mica, those are verbs. Those are injunctions. Those are orders. Do justice. Don't think about it. Don't write it. Well, you do have to think about it, but, but that's, not, that's not the commandment from, from the Lord. That's not what is good. Do justice. That's policy. That's society. That's interaction. That's living with others. That's rules, laws, a just society. But it's not, as we heard at the beginning of the Micah, burnt offerings and rivers of oil and my firstborn. That's not required. Love mercy. The reason that I asked to have this read from King James is that in your Bibles in the pew, you will find that that in the Micah says love kindness. Uh, kindness to me is whatever. Uh, give a dollar to the homeless person. Uh, give a lollipop to a child, those the individual and sort of, sort of trivial acts. Mercy is corporate. Mercy is policy. And I have some authority for the difference in translation. First of all, <laughs> 1887, when Goodenow commissioned that, that window for this church, it says mercy, and that is the King James Version. But I asked, I asked uh, Jonathan Cohen that I go to for, for all things uh, Hebrew, and he looked it up for me, and he said that actually the, tr the best uh, translation is that uh, uh, mercy, the root means mercy translated into deeds. There is that component to that Hebrew word. And the third element is walk humbly. Walk. Don't stand there. Do something. And with humility. Evaluate, reject rigidity, experiment, change, claim what expands justice with mercy and honest and candid. With the increase in our power comes the danger of hubris and, and chauvinism. So what behaviors lead us there to inform uh, justice? And that's the Matthew. That's a start. And it's only a start because of its somewhat limited scope to the, to the more uh, immediate necessities of human life. But it is also instructive to look at the Matthew the way, the way I do now when I read it the structure of chapter 25 in Matthew is that the whole chapter is talking about the kingdom of heaven. The first, sec the first section is the parable of the ten virgins. And it's said to be a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like. And the ten virgins, and no man knows the date or the hour. But it's pretty binary. The ones that don't prepare, they're locked out into the outer darkness. No oil, you didn't do it, you're gone. The ones that had the oil, that prepared, that worked, they are welcomed into the banquet. The second story in Matthew is again a parable, the one about the five talents. Again, it's not known the day or the hour when the Lord will come. 
and he gives the talons five and three and one. And the poor sap that gets the one talon goes and buries it. The judgment, again, is severe. Cast out, outer darkness. Not only that, but the, <laughs> the poor guy's insulted on the way out as wicked and slothful. And so then we have verse 31 that Bob read for us. It is not a parable. On its face, it says, it does not say that this is, the kingdom is like this. This is it. And that's, it's so easy in, in our culture to say, well, it starts out talking about the kingdom when the Lord comes in his glory. It's saying that that's what's going to happen. When the Son of Man comes and sits on the throne, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the angels with him, then shall he sit upon his throne and before him shall be gathered all nations. Nations. There is to my very, very limited knowledge, and I probably will be corrected at some point and called down, there's no question about that translation. They knew the word, and that word has survived all translations that I know about in the Bible, that it's all nations that will appear, and they're sorted. The nations are sorted by deeds. Those deeds are the deeds that are recited in terms of the hungry, I was thirsty, I was hungry, I was a stranger, naked, sick, in prison, and you can expand those every one of those fairly obviously to a great many other things in prison, all kinds of prisons and sicknesses, addictions, um, stranger, isolation. And they ask him, when, when, did, we, when did we do those? When, what individual acts did we, did we do those to for the uh, for ministering unto you. I was in prison and you came to me. I was sick and you visited me. And they said, well, when? Individual acts done to anyone is the answer. To anyone. That's the generality. To anyone, to the weak, to the widows, the orphans, the needy, to anyone that the societal group has ignored and abandoned. What, done to, what is done to all is justice. That's policy. That's generality. Those on the left hand in the Matthew, bang, you're gone, you're out. And they say, well, 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 what happened? What, what did we do? What didn't we do? When, when we didn't know, uh, what are you talking about? When were you naked and sick and thirsty and we, and we didn't minister unto you? And if there's any doubt about what's being said here, it's in, the answer is in the last line. That's what, what's lacking is not doing it to any individual. Individual acts of charity and whatever can be, are fine, but they are not what's required in terms of policy. It, they're not required in terms of what's salvation in Matthew. Verily I say unto you, insomuch as ye did it not to one, of the least of these. You miss just one in the whole world and you have failed. If your policy doesn't reach everyone, then it's everlasting, right, uh, an everlasting punishment. What's not here, as we know from the mica is the rivers of oil being required or the firstborn or calves. What's not here in, the, in, the, in other versions of, and other statements of 
of a salvation, I guess you would say, or faith, baptism, being born again, a personal relationship with Jesus. It's not here. Not in this iteration of what's required. I'm not very big on heaven and hell and don't need that to read this and to struggle with the moral imperative. The failure to do what we ought to do and to, to achieve it, that failure is hell on earth. And the doing of it, the creation of justice, is what prepares us and is heaven here now. We know what we ought to do. We must act towards all in the nation. So here we do. That's what we ought to do. We ought to create justice. All you need is those, those actions. Our collective Salvation depends upon how we structure society. So we're done. We know the answer, and I can sit down. Ha. Huh. We, we know it's not that simple. How does it help us? How does it, deal, how does it help us now to deal with everything that we face? And you can, you know, the climate change, the CMP card, or what's going on in Gaza, in Haiti, the treatment of the, the last and the least, how we handle all of our social policy decisions. I am not naive about the complexity of the problems, but what we have is an attitude of how to move ahead. Finding answers, creating a just society is incredibly difficult. But framed this way and approached with love and the humanity of Matthew and the directions of Micah, those tasks are open-ended and they require dialogue, respect, community, objective reference, shared goals, endless debate. When we get to policy, what's required in creation of justice is mercy, is the corporate attitude and internalizing that love mercy. Make it, make it a preference, make it the, what cannot be avoided. That's, that's the, the context of love mercy. And maybe most important, humility. Walk humbly with your God as you undertake these tasks and these decisions, but you undertake them together in community. Each individual is, we learn from the Matthew, is, is supremely valuable and must be included in order to create a just society. We are in good company in this church, in this incredibly difficult task of struggling with and carrying out the moral imperatives that we are given. John Adams, our first president, uh, and John Quincy Adams, his son, our sixth president, struggled in the deism of the day to create a just society Jefferson had these scriptures in front of him and they're echoed in all men are created equal, infused with the philosophy of John Locke which, who also had these scriptures in front of him. But that's the problem, isn't it? These texts, the way we have them now, were in front of them. And George Washington owned slaves and we slaughtered tens of thousands of indigenous people. They saw these challenges and struggled with them. And we now 
are struggling with continuing that evolution. We will be judged by the quality of our justice. We've moved somewhat forward, but it's hard work. It can't be done individually. And it can't be done with each person making their own decisions and saying that they're valid. That cuts off the attempt to do justly. We need to sit with the inconsistencies and the answers through history and learn and refine them and discern and reformulate them. We know that I can be charitable and moral and still profit from a system that burdens others and unduly rewards me. John Adams died uh, July 4th 1826 at the, <clears throat> excuse me, at the age of 91. Thomas Jefferson died that very same day, July 4th, 1826, also in his 90s, hundreds of miles, of <clears throat> hundreds of miles apart. They had an ongoing constant dialogue that never stopped year after year from since the revolution in, in 1776 and the constitution in 1787. John Adams, the, the eulogies after their deaths uh, went on for months in speeches and editorials about their public life, discourse, and service. Yet all who had known them firsthand were all gone and could quote only from the historical record. It was to his grandchildren that he left his personal wisdom. This is John Adams. One letter a few months before he died was to his granddaughter, Caroline, then in her 50s, who had expressed her quandary over the riddles of life. He wrote to her, you are not singular in your suspicions that you know but little. The longer I live, the more I read, the more I patiently think, and the more anxiously I inquire, the less I seem to know. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. This is enough. At the bottom of the good now window that quotes the Micah, he says, I have kept the faith. Amen. <clears throat>